welcome. <laughs> he wants something, and he's willing to go to any lengths, any heights, travel at any speed, through the most terrifying twists and turns. To get it, the Phantom's Revenge is now open. So there's no turning back. <laughs> Revenge will be mine. Is there a more famous story in the coaster world than the story of Phantom's Revenge? The record-breaking Arrow Hyperlooper reborn as an inversionless airtime machine after less than a decade of operation has been hailed as the ultimate rags to riches story, winning over the hearts and minds of coaster enthusiasts the world over. Praise is heaped on this unique ride year after year, many continuing to tout it as the best coaster in the state, even in the face of stiff, more modern competition. Is this deserved? More importantly, what is it that makes Phantom so lauded? What the hell happened in this ride's twisted and bizarre history that led to such a compelling product? To borrow a turn of phrase, well... How did I get here? Actually, let's talk about how I got here for a quick second. Since I started this channel, a lot of people have asked me how I developed my love for roller coasters, and thankfully for me, there is a straightforward answer. The seeds for my obsession were planted decades ago, all the way back in 1998. My parents, aunt, uncle, cousins, and I trekked down all the way from New York City to Williamsburg, Virginia, and I just made the cut to plop my four-year-old tush into the trains of the venerable Big Bad Wolf. One ride later, I was hooked. Nessie, my first looper, followed in rapid succession the next year, and it was game over from there. As soon as I could, I had conquered every coaster at Busch Gardens Williamsburg, proudly donning my Fear to Four t-shirt as I slayed b and behemoths like Apollo's Chariot and Alpengeist. I felt like the king of the world. Still, amid the childlike ecstasy, I could sense there was something missing, something else out there. My suspicions were confirmed when we hopped on the train tour and I feasted my eyes on a well-hidden electric blue behemoth tucked away in the corner of the park. It looked stunning, a twisted mess of track featuring crazy elements that I had never seen before. I furiously pressed the park employee on the train, impatiently inquiring about this seemingly brand new coaster and wondering why I had never heard of it. She refused to acknowledge me. And in these pre-internet days, I was resigned to treat this coaster as a fever dream which somehow seeped into the depths of my subconscious. A discrepancy easily explained by an overactive childhood imagination. Then I found out it was real. Now you're probably wondering why I started a video about Phantom's Revenge by discussing Dragonfire, but much like BGW's true Loch Ness Monster, Phantom's predecessor lives on in a similar plane, as a lost experience, a coaster cryptid. Remnants of the old Steel Phantom still remain, but they are warped and twisted to such a degree that it's nearly unrecognizable. The comically tightened versions that broke necks in the previous decades have long since returned to the Earth. Outside the minds of Yinzers and sweaty obsessed arrowheads, Steel Phantom is comfortably resigned to the back burner of history. We've accepted this history because we've lived in it for so long to the point that we gloss over just how insane that is. Steel Phantom and Dragonfire, headlining attractions of the early 90s that pushed the roller coaster further into the future both opening to rave reviews and proudly standing as flagships of their respective parks. Ten years later, they were gone. This is almost unprecedented in the coaster world, but let's dip our toes into the Twilight Zone for a second and meet the ghost of the Arrow Hyperlooper in its ethereal resting place. Was this the fate that Steel Phantom deserved? Or does Phantom's Revenge, Frankenstein into a distorted, ferocious facsimile of its former self at the dawn of the new millennium, Fulfill the aborted promise of its forebearer? I don't know, I never rode Seal Phantom. It's like this and like that and like this and a Drake creep to the mic like a fan. Well, I'm Back to the real world. Standing in front of us all these years later is Phantom's Revenge. And good news, the ride is still weird. So fucking weird. It may not quite match the insanity of the original, but lucky for us, Kennywood's bastard child hyperconversion remains a wholly singular experience over two decades later. Nowhere else will you find butchered our looper trains restraining riders through intense ejector airtime with what basically amounts to a pool noodle. Nowhere else will you see a 200 foot long section of straight track pointed southward, beckoning you down towards the bottom of a ravine. 
Nowhere else will you see the blueprint for the RMC conversion laid out for all to see in the rusty hills of Steelers country, beating Shoki to the punch by a full decade. And this tracks, even before its surgical transformation at the hands of Dr. Morgenstein, Steel Phantom was like nothing else. But should we be surprised, this is Kenny Wood we are talking about. The whole park is about the size of an NBA player's shoe. The park has made a name of itself over the past 125 years by working with its terrain to develop some truly unique coasters. Even their more traditional rides are molded by the dictates of Kennywood's cramped and rugged landscape. It's 1990 and Kennywood wants a hyper coaster? Well, no way you're plopping down a Magnum clone with this land to work with. To even pass the 200 foot threshold, Harry Henninger, the legendary former CEO of Kennywood and certified badass, had to think outside the box. And what he came up with was a stroke of genius. What if, instead of going up 200 feet vertically, the coaster hit the hyper mark by shooting down the ravine? And one night I was dreaming and said, but if you put the 200 foot drop in the middle of the ride, you don't build up additional energy and you overcome two problems. And I came out the next morning and went straight and looked at the Thunderbolt and ordered some gateway engineering surveying done to see if the idea was possible. And it was. Hey guys, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed what you're seeing so far, please give the video a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. As a smaller YouTube channel, it's really hard for me to pierce through the YouTube algorithm, but every like, every comment, and every subscription really helps. Thanks so much, and enjoy the rest of the video. Now on the face of it, it seems that cramming a hyper coaster into tiny, money-strapped Kennywood was a terrible idea in the first place. Why does Kennywood need a hyper? Why do you still try to cram yourself into your favorite college shirt you outgrew 30 pounds ago just to walk around town looking like George Costanza? It's time to admit that you're too big for this. But it's easy to overlook if you're not a local that Kennywood was and is in direct competition with Cedar Point only three hours away. So it's sensible that Kennywood wanted to steal the headlines. The new ride needed to shatter the height and speed record set by Magnum XL 200 two years earlier. We Pennsylvanians weren't gonna let goddamn Ohio get away with it. The more baffling decision, no doubt, was to make the new world's fastest coaster a multi-looper. There was no need to add inversions to Arrow's and the world's literal second hyper, especially given Kennywood's land situation and Arrow's design philosophy. I thought for a while that this was Arrow designer and coat hanger extraordinaire Ron Toomer's brainchild, cause like, that seems like something he would think up. There isn't enough room to put the loop 100 feet in the air like you did with Viper, Ron. But then, straight from the man itself, I heard that it was Henny's idea. At the time, I, I was very fortunate that I got to go ride a lot of things, so I went out to Magic Mountain and the Viper was out there and there were two aspects of the Viper that I particularly cared for. One was the sweeping turn off of the lift. Uh, I thought that was a, uh, a, a wonderful uh, gut-wrenching sensation. And the, others, the other thing was that uh, they did have, it was the time of inversions, uh, loops and corkscrews and a few others were uh, boomerangs were, were in vogue. And it just seemed like that would be, a, again, uh, you eat up a lot of energy uh, in inversions that you don't in flat track. Now, longtime viewers of the channel know that I have an unhealthy obsession with Viper, my favorite roller coaster and one of my three true loves, tied with Magnum XL 200 and my dog. Let's put aside my biases for a second and look at Viper from a more objective standpoint. Even outside of the insular world of Arrow devotees, most enthusiasts tend to agree that Viper is one of, if not the, smoothest sour loopers out there. And for a myriad of reasons that I will get into eventually when I release my Viper video that I've been working on in fits and starts for like a year, Viper's creation was basically the perfect storm of layout changes, design improvements, and plain old luck to culminate in a well-tracking machine that is shockingly devoid of the infamous arrow transitions that were legion on the other mega loopers. It's hard to fault Henny for falling in love with maybe the greatest looping coaster ever created, but had he ridden Shockwave at Great America instead of Zaddy Viper, the course of history may have taken a slightly different track. You all know what's coming up. The loops are in and Arrow is making it. I can hear the screams of terror from here. Maybe the upcoming complaints of roughness could have been eluded altogether if Kennywood decided to go with a different company to build their record breaker, 
but I've run out of coins to put in the what if machine, so I guess we'll never know. The reality is, and this is something that may trigger a rabid RMC fanboy thuzies that have no interest in any coaster built before 2015, so I will distract you with this video of a delightful RMC pre-lift in the bottom left corner. Henny wanted Arrow to do the job. At the time, they were the leading uh, developer. It was before Dana Morgan, it was before B&M. We had gone through a roller coaster that was Intamin, but built by Schwarzkopf, which was the laser loop. And anytime you do something, uh, cutting edge technology, you wind up with some bruises. And so let's just say that our relationship with, with Arrow is closer at that moment. First off, his vendetta against Schwarzkopf is hilarious. And secondly, Arrow was the go-to for a project like this. No one else had made a hypercoaster. Literally, Magnum was the only one in existence. And in 1990, Arrow was at the height of their powers, having just produced their Magnum opuses, Magnum and Viper, back to back. Both are still thrilling riders decades later, unlike many other Arrows made both before and after that are no longer with us. The only other company in the hyper conversation was Togo, but like, come on, you're gonna pick Togo for this? <coughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Intamin's most recent project in America was a bobsled in a cage. B&M, well, they were about to pop onto the scene with a teensy little drop in two inversions and a goddamn stand-up coaster. Go big or go home, it's gotta be Arrow. Ah, oh, but hindsight is 2020, eh, Henny? The gift of time allows us to see how crazy this idea truly was, especially as we begin to see the gargantuan steel structure that is Steel Phantom make its mark on the rolling Pittsburgh terrain. Too late, though. I guess Kennywood will have to learn their lesson the hard way, or maybe not, given that they would proceed to make the same mistake a few decades later. If Magnum looked ambitious a few years before, Steel Phantom was about to yell, hold my beer, before belly flopping right off the diving board. And belly flop it did opening to horrid reviews as newscasters and enthusiasts the world over were grounded into a pulp by the black and iron meat mincer that was Kennywood's greatest indignity. So fine, we fucked up. What do we do now? Steel Phantom was meant to be the symbol of Kennywood, but the final product was so dreadful that it could only serve as a symbol to a monumental fuck up. The already poor reputation of the ride continued to tumble year after year, and in a fit of desperation, Kennywood was forced to salvage their massive investment by turning to D.H. Moore. Oh wait, every last statement in that last paragraph was a complete lie. People loved the damn ride. It's the best coaster, steel coaster I've ever been on. This is my personal favorite. And these guys ought to know, they're local members of the American coaster enthusiasts invited for a test run of the Phantom. Sure, it was rough. Like, remove the earrings from your face if you want to live rough. But it was also unique, iconic, forceful, and absolutely unhinged. Scores of interviewed acers fawned over the Phantom on opening day, claiming it to be the most intense coaster ever made. It continued to get positive coverage, and even in its final years, the newly created Golden Ticket Awards were proud to present Steel Phantom with near top 10 finishes in both 1998 and 1999. The number four coaster on the countdown is the sleek Steel Phantom. This speed machine makes its home, appropriately, in the heart of steel country, at Kennywood Park in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. When the Phantom met its shocking demise, there was an outcry from locals and enthusiasts alike, as Kennywood was literally flooded with protest letters hoping to save the proud patron of Pittsburgh. How could we give up on Steel Phantom so soon? In preparing this video, I spent a lot of time trying to pinpoint the why of Phantom's conversion. There is a common wisdom in 2023. Most Thuzies today will quickly answer that question with some variant of, Eh, Steel Phantom sucked, it was rough, everyone hated it. But through my research, I found that that was far from the case. No doubt this ride attracted its fair share of haters, but I was honestly surprised, even as the arrowhead that I am, to see Steel Phantom racking up industry awards all the way up to its final seasons. As with most things, the truth of Steel Phantom's device is far more murky. Which makes my search for a straightforward answer all the more unsatisfying. All that I was able to find from Kennywood itself was a canned statement in a 2001 news article that went as follows. Kennywood officials decided it had to be replaced to keep the park competitive in this age when new multi-million dollar roller coasters open every year in theme parks. And uh, this isn't very enlightening. It does offer us a subtle but important distinction. 
The Steel Phantom wasn't going down because it was bad, but because Kennywood believed it could do even better. After all, as we have already discussed, Kennywood is absolutely tiny. If they want to put in a new roller coaster, they're going to have to tear out an old one, and that's a fact of life. And if Steel Phantom's removal was controversial, imagine the outcry if Kennywood chose to remove one of their historic woodies in its stead. But Kennywood could also just be saying that, to placate the horde of angry Steelers fans flooding the park with their primanti stained hate letters. It's just impossible to tell. With two decades of history warping historical perspectives, it's very likely that we will never have a straightforward answer, and the folk story passed down by enthusiasts will continue to serve as the popular canon. It's time to fast forward though, step out of your E30, put down the Sega Genesis, and stop listening to vintage cassettes unironically. Steel Phantom belongs to a world that doesn't exist anymore. Somewhere, someone cooked up the absolutely insane idea to morph the carcass of this still relatively new Hyperlooper into something very different. From the ashes of its predecessor, the Phantom would have its revenge. <laughs> revenge will be mine. Was this, like, a good idea? Recently I've been hearing a constant stream of completely unsubstantiated rumors claiming that Kennywood was considering replacing the Phantom with an Intamin Giga. And just imagine that. Maybe a half-executed overhaul of a dated, unhinged relic from a disgraced, soon-to-be bankrupt manufacturer wasn't the move, when the Yinzers could have had themselves a cliff-diving Millie. Especially now, two decades later, when companies like RMC have completely defined what it means to build a roller coaster, Phantom seems woefully dated in comparison. But can the old girls still keep up? Personally, I'm fine with the decision Kennywood made. Phantom's Revenge may be a masterpiece. I mean, let's be real, even if Phantom's Revenge was a terrible ride, the coaster world needs this thing to exist. There's no guarantee that inspiration would have struck RMC had Phantom not blazed the trail 10 years before. Would the Iron Horse conversion exist without his exemplar in the Alleghenies? Phantom's conversion did what was thought impossible, perfectly utilizing the structure and course of its predecessor while redefining the ride experience all the same. Without a Phantom, there's no New Texas Giant, and without a New Texas Giant, there's no Steve. In fact, I have to commend Phantom in comparison to its spiritual successors because Phantom does a much better job than any RMC at retaining the original character of the ride, which in this case is a good thing. Phantom wears its arrow roots on its sleeve like a faded tramp stamp your mother got after a Motley Crue concert before she met your father. From the perfectly preserved cacophonous clack of the trussed up lift hill, I'm sorry, I got distracted for a second, to the bizarre insanity of that second drop, Phantom sure doesn't feel like a Morgan, the company run by the former CEO of Arrow that was tasked with the conversion. Now Morgan did change a lot, but they knew where not to mess with the formula. A more modern mind would look at the bizarre profiling of the legendary cliffside plunge and morph it into a floaty, boring zero-g roll without a second thought which would prompt me to burn down Kennywood if it ever happened. Yeah, the whole first half of the ride is weird. Phantom is better for it. 80% of the bizarrely designed yet brilliantly executed legendary second drop is a flat ramp, which you would never see on a modern coaster, descending interminably down the ravine to the depths of the Monagalia? Wait, this wasn't the Ohio? Well, you lied to me, Primanti brothers. Staring at the drop from the station is just so funny though, it just goes whoop down the ravine like an extremely steep handicap ramp. And you would think that a drop profiled like this would be garbage, like many ramp drops from other less seminal companies have proven to be. But Phantoms is brilliant. A strong head of steam leading into the drop always helps, but the old school crest is a secret sauce. It's tight and filled with tangent radius goodness. If you look at old photos of Phantom, you'll notice that the new track actually starts here, where the crest of the second drop flattens out, and the new track follows the support structure from the original drop identically. So yeah, we have a circular crest. Since the curve isn't parabolic, the airtime grows stronger and stronger over the crest as you slope further downwards no matter where you are in the train. In the back car, you get lifted out of your seat right away, but the pool noodle drags you down harder and harder with ever-escalating force as the drop continues. This pull never lets up until the crest transitions to ramp and you slam back down again. And for the briefest of flashes, it feels like the party's over, but there's plenty more goodness ahead. The drop is still pretty steep. 
No doubt the whole experience is elevated by the insane visual of plunging headfirst into the bottom of a ravine, but even divorced from its setting, the cliff dive manages to deliver a solid floater. I figured out my strategy early. Once the crest ends and you drop back into your seat, just kick your legs off the bottom of the train and feel yourself float the whole way down. There's nothing else like it. And then you return to terra firma after piercing the structure of Thunderbolt and are greeted by Phantom's second party trick, the positives. My god, no one talks about the positives on this ride, and that is a sinful omission because they are pummeling. The pullout from the second drop is just nasty, combining strong and sustained Gs with breakneck pace and utter claustrophobia. But the sheer force is actually matched by the pullout of the first drop, which shocked me every time with some real motherfucking Gs. The straight track still seems weird, but I will take this totally unnoticeable 0.2 seconds of respite for a pullout this tight. And that's what she said. And the plop down after the turnaround features similarly heroic forces. It feels like you're being crushed down into a cube by a hydraulic press, so you'll be small enough to fit through the bafflingly tight tunnel that follows. Then all hell breaks loose. Somebody please describe to me how this hill is so good. From every POV I've seen, it looks like Phantom levels off the teensiest amount to exit the tunnel without crashing into the support structure of Thunderbolt. That's not what it feels like on the ride. It's amazing. It's shockingly sustained no matter where you are in the train. The back gives strong and sustained floater throughout, bordering on ejector airtime, but the front has the sauce with great, long-lasting ejector here. It's tasty and serves as a delightful appetizer for the delicious ejector finale that follows. Though well, I guess this hill thrusts its riders up a bit too hard, and Phantom needs to catch its breath for a bit before it can bring itself to climax. It's okay, buddy, we all need to take a break sometimes. Give it five seconds before the gas station dick pills kick in, and enjoy the nice, relaxing view of the turtle while you wait. Oh, he's ready to go. <laughs> One second, gotta pass under the brake run. <laughs> oh, daddy, this is the shit. Phantom masterfully pivots from a positively pummeling speed demon to a mechanical bull in rapid fashion. Every single one of these four tiny hills sends the whole train flying, and now you realize how hilarious those restraints are. The only thing keeping you from being thrown into Ohio is a loosely fitting seatbelt and a side-loading lap bar which sits comfortably above the thighs of most riders. And given that it's hinged on the side and the high sills of the train car, it's nearly impossible for the outer side of the restraint to actually make contact with your body. Imagine these on Magnum, man. This feels like it's illegal is a bit of a cliche, said about Phantom many times to be fair, but Phantom should probably be at least supervised, uh, put on parole, maybe get an ankle bracelet around the rear truck, j just in case. This whole sequence is a bit weirdly paced, with an understandable lull in the middle of the airtime assault to clear the final brake run, but hills of this size should not deliver airtime like this. Ejector? Yeah, that makes sense. But the sustain is the surprising part. It doesn't quite match the yeet factor of the Triangle Hills, but Phantom has it beat on endurance. I just wish the double down didn't have a trim. I know it wasn't there before, and I'm sure there's a good structural reason for it, but like, c come on, for, for me, Please. The turnaround is a bit of a dead spot. It's the new song that your favorite boomer rock band had to insert in the middle of their concert. It doesn't really do much and no one's very excited by it, but it's a good chance to catch your breath and maybe take a quick piss break before they bring the house down with the finale. And that finale is gonna get the crowd going. One more ejector hill tries to send you into space before the train tightly pops into the brakes in true arrow fashion. You were going way too fast for being this close to the station, so brace yourself. I mean, this thing gives the Superman clones a run for their money. In fact, the back gets robbed of this buffet of airtime because you are breaking already by the time you really get into it. This means that you get the Superman sensation of being slammed into the restraint as the back row gets braked hard mid-airtime hill, but this time it's way more comfortable on this one. A lot of word vomit has been spewed about Phantom's powerful finale, and I understand why, trust me. What I think gets lost in discussion sometimes is the variety that Phantom delivers. It's the opposite of a one-trick pony. Like other great old coasters, Phantom swaps personalities effortlessly. From the speedy Dr. Jekyll to the vengeful Mr. Hyde. It's like getting into the center of a Tootsie Pop when it goes from sweet sugar to chewy deliciousness. It also makes Phantom infinitely rewritable. The crazy airtime of the back half relieves you from the crushing positives of the first half, leading to a very well-rounded experience. I'm sure it's short, but I never got off Phantom feeling like I was shortchanged. 
and that's more in Kennywood anyway, given their limited budget and tiny footprint. The ops were great. Dispatches are pretty fast, and there's no air gates, so if you want more, just get back in line. There is one final thing that makes Phantom stand out, and I've alluded to it many times already. It's unique. It's just full of character. The glorious Daryl Lift Hill adds a lot, obviously, but Phantom is just one of those coasters that make you lean back and think, wow, this thing is so cool. The way it pops out and snakes over the ravine, framed against the industrial backdrop of the old steel mill, the way it presents itself to future patrons waiting in the station, ostentatiously tossing its riders out of the car while blazing by at high speed. The whole aesthetic of the thing, it's very industrial punk with the lattice structures and bulky supports, and yet it doesn't really look like an arrow, it looks like something completely its own. It was cooler when it was mint green, but whatever, go Ravens, I guess? The coaster enthusiasts are going to travel from around the world to ride Phantom. Unlike, say, a B&M Invert or a Gerslara Eurofighter, you can't just schlep over to your home park and get a comparable experience. And that's becoming less and less common lately. Modernity has homogenized the roller coaster experience in many ways, and this is not necessarily a bad thing, as modern rides offer elements that companies of yesteryear could only dream of. But a bit of variety is lost in the process. New Intamins are starting to feel like RMCs, and new RMCs feel like every other RMC. RMC never misses, sure, it's like the Sam Adams of coaster manufacturers. You know, every winter you're getting the cold snap, and every summer you're getting the Sam summer. Maybe once a year you'll see a new flavor flash on the market before disappearing. It's tasty, you get a nice buzz, and then you move on because it's the exact same beer you've been drinking for years. But Phantom? Phantom is the church brew works. Some crazy motherfuckers who bought out a church to turn it into an angelic beer factory that churns out cans the size of your face. Enjoy the new two liter silo can. You walk through that door and you know you're getting something different. Despite this adulation though, I can't help but feel like there's something missing. And there are a few moments where Phantom noticeably steps its foot off the gas in a way that its predecessor certainly did not. Mimi Morgan went a bit too far in the other direction when smoothing out Arrow's rough edges. My mind is inexplicably drawn to Viper's first drop, which is the inspiration for Phantoms. Not just because I think about it way too often, which I do, but that's besides the point. Legit, I think Viper features one of the best non-straight first drops in the industry. The long train gives the front overhang over the brief section of straight track, flexing its height and building tension in a manner reminiscent of a dive coaster. And for those seated in the back though, the tight crest provides a violent and delicious pop of ejector airtime before throwing its riders into some absolutely wicked banking that gives a strong burst of laterals. Laterals continue as the track gently but unnaturally unbanks, which is an awesome feeling, and riders are crushed at the valley by solid positive Gs. I came into Phantom expecting this glorious experience because like, come on, look at them, they're, they're the same drop. And the positive Gs were great, but I was left extremely disappointed when the first drop delivered a moment of weak lift and gentle turning. I don't know if Steel Phantom felt like this, of course, because I never wrote it, but I think I have enough grounds to make the assumption that it was at least a bit wilder. The ejector finale is great, and it comes close to matching the power of Magnum's unhinged finale, but it doesn't. I mean, nothing can. Oh, daddy. And that whole ravine run, the awesome low to the ground pullout transitioning into the scenic overbank, it's fast and smooth, too smooth. It's utterly devoid of the weird kinks and awkward transitions that provide some needed jank to this somewhat weak spot, like the insane ejector pop going into the corkscrews in the Carolina Cyclone, or that fun little shuffle going down the second hill of Magnum that gives an otherwise boring element some character. Oh god, he's gonna say it, isn't he? Someone stop him. He's gonna say it. He's gonna say it. Steel Phantom looks like a better ride. Like, Phantom's Revenge is crazy, but Steel Phantom is out for blood. A Phantom's Revenge is imposing enough to serve as the final boss, but like, you know halfway through the boss battle, when you thought you won, but suddenly the boss transforms into something way stronger and way more terrifying? It's true form? That's Steel Phantom. We've been robbed of Steel Phantom's true form, and in the process we've lost something truly special. Okay, well that's what I wanted to say, but I can't lie. While gathering the footage for this video, I have to conclude that maybe the haters were right. The original looks brutal. Every single reverse POV I see shows riders' heads bouncing around like a pinball. You can ride most arrows defensively and get a completely pain-free riding experience by leaning into the transitions, but Steel Phantom has so much coming at you so fast that there's no way anyone can keep up. 
As painful as it is for me to say, even I will admit that Steel Phantom probably took things a bit too far. But then I look at Steel Phantom's POV and I can't help but yearn. That comically tight valley that leads into the world's funniest straight ramp before the loop, a split second of five punishing Gs that would be inconceivable in a modern design. The requisite set of trims that put up a valiant effort but are woefully inadequate against the sheer momentum of the furious train. I wax poetic about the trash compactor feeling you get going through the vertical loops on Viper. The Steel Phantom takes this up another notch, hitting six Gs through the element. The Batwing is taken at inhuman speed, a full 2.3 seconds faster than Viper, and I clocked that. Held the whole back half, I had to check my YouTube settings to ensure I didn't leave the video at 1.25 times speed by accident. They do not make rides like this anymore. And each time we lose a Radwood era arrow, a unique experience is forever buried in the ever-shifting sands of time. And that said, most everyone will contend that Phantom's Rebirth was a brilliant decision. Phantom's Revenge is powerful but infinitely rewritable, and Steel Phantom ground its riders to a pulp. It was truly too much, a fateful example of what happens when ambition outpaces innovation. But five rides and the millennial masterpiece that is Phantom's Revenge has only fed my desire to hop in the DeLorean and ride the original just one time. Much like my childhood reminiscence of Drakenfire, Steel Phantom only exists now as a perception, a fever dream. But it is a dream of mine, and we should all chase our dreams, right? Obviously, that's not going to happen. But that's okay, because sometimes things do rise from the dead, and there's still plenty to dream about today. Isn't there? Hey guys, so uh, thanks for watching, maybe like the third time. <laughs> okay, a few months after I initially released this video, I was informed by a friend that a large chunk of footage was missing from the middle of the video at like the 16 minute mark, which is something I just plain didn't notice when I first kind of uploaded the combined take. And also some of the music was copyright struck, so yeah, it, it was time for a re-upload. I didn't want to do it too quickly after the first video because, you know, I didn't want to make it look like I was just wringing everything out of here, but I do want the video to kind of stand at its best on my channel. So if you haven't seen it before, I hope you enjoyed. This is one of my favorite videos that I've ever made. If you have seen it before and made it to the end again, well, thank you. Go out and watch my i305 elegy, I think it's even better than this video, and as well as my El Toro elegy and some of my other more serious videos. If you want something a little more laid back, go watch some of my vlogs, go watch some of my coaster roasts, and as always, thank you for watching.